Λοιπόν, καλησπέρα σε όλου. Είμαι ο Τάσο Τσακύρογλου από την εφημερίδα των Συντακτών. Σα ευχαριστώ όλου που είστε απόψε εδώ. Ευχαριστώ και τι εκδόσει του 21ου για την πρόσκληση. Ε, Δυστυχώ, συμπέσαμε και με τη μεγάλη διαδήλωση για το Παλαιστινιακό και αρκετοί που θα ήθελαν να είναι εδώ πέρα δεν μπόρεσαν να έρθουν. Ε, νιώθουμε πολύ όμορφα σε αυτό το ιστορικό κτίριο που αναδεικνύει την ανάγκη τα δημόσια κτίρια να είναι ανοιχτά στο κοινό και όλοι οι δημόσιοι χώροι. Ε, θα μου συγχωρήσετε τη φωνή, αλλά και κάποιες ανάσες, γιατί με ταλαιπωρεί ένα κρυολόγημα. Καταρχάς, θα πρέπει να πω ότι νιώθω πολύ μεγάλη τιμή να πρέπει να μιλήσω για έναν άνθρωπο και για ένα έργο το οποίο θεωρώ είναι πολύ σκορυφαίο καθώς ερμηνεύει αρκετά από τα ενίγματα της εποχής μας, διευκολύνοντάς μας να κατανοήσουμε αντιφάσεις που για το μέσο άνθρωπο είναι δυσερμήνευτες. Κατά την ταπνή μου άποψη, είναι ο πιο εμπριθής αναλυτής του 20ου αιώνα και των περιπλοκών που αυτός γέννησε. Δύο παγκόσμιους πολέμους, φασισμό, σταλινισμό, αλλά και επαναστάσεις όπως η Ρώσικη, η Κινέζικη και η Κουβανέζικη. Όμως δεν είναι μόνο αυτό. Δεν αναλύει μόνο όσα εμπίπτουν στο πεδίο της βιωμένης εμπειρία, δηλαδή στο παρελθόν, αλλά και σε ένα ορίζοντα της προσμονής, δηλαδή στο μέλλον προς το οποίο κατευθύνονται σκέψεις και ενέργειες, όρους που δανείζεται από το γερμανό ιστορικό Ράινχαρτ Κοζέλεκ. Αρχικά, ο Ένσο Τραβέρσο μας δείχνει την αντιφατική φύση των επαναστάσεων. Από τη μία, της περιγράφησα την ανάσα της ιστορίας και νομίζω ότι αναφέρεται εδώ στην αναγκαιότητά τους και στη συνέχεια σαν ιστορικές εκρήξεις, αφού αυτές έχουν ήδη εκδηλωθεί. Καταλήγει δε να περιγράψει αυτό που χαρακτηρίζει ως τραγωδία των επαναστάσεων ως εξή. Η τραγωδία τους έγινε στη μοιραία μεταμόρφωση που τις οδηγεί από την απελευθέρωση στον αγώνα για επιβίωση και τελικά στην οικοδόμηση μιας νέας καταπιεστικής νομοθεσίας. Ορίστε πώς συμβαίνει το πέρασμα από τη χειραφετησιακή στην εξαναγκαστική βία. Φυσικά, δεν παραλείπει να περιγράψει τη δημιουργική πνοή που εμπνέουν οι επαναστάσεις στην τέχνη. Ο Οκτώβρης, μας λέει ο Τραβέρσο, δημιούργησε ένα ασυνήθιστο αναβρασμό με την άνθηση πρωτοποριακών ρευμάτων, όπως ο ρώσικος φουτουρισμός, ο σουπρεματισμός και ο κονστρουκτιβισμός. Ενώ η εξέγερση των σπαρτακιστών στο Βερολίνο συνέπεσε με την ανάδυση του νταντάισμού και του εξπρεσιονισμού για να ακολουθήσει στις αρχές της δεκαετίας του 20 ο σουρεαλισμός. Από τα δυνατότερα σημεία του βιβλίου είναι εκείνα στα οποία ασκεί κριτική όχι μόνο στους πρωταγωνιστές των επαναστάσεων, αλλά ακόμη και στους κλασικούς του μαρξισμού, τους οποίους βλέπει όχι σαν κάποια ιερά το τεμ, για τα οποία υπάρχει το ταμπού να μην τα αγγίξουμε. Ένα από τα προτερήματα της δουλειά του Τραβέρσο συνίσταται στην ικανότητά του να τοποθετεί κάθε σημαντικό πρόσωπο στις ιστορικές του διαστάσεις, δηλαδή στον πνευματικό περίγυρο και στα κυρίαρχα ρεύματα ιδεών της εποχής τους. Ο Μάρξ, για παράδειγμα, όπως λέει ο ίδιος, ουσιαστικά πάτησε σε δύο βάρκες, καθώς από τη μία συμμεριζόταν την κριτική των ρομαντικών, στο βαθμό που στο χώρο του εργοστασίου οι εργάτες μετατρέπονται σε απλά εξαρτήματα των μηχανών, ενώ ταυτόχρονα, σε αντίθεση με εκείνους, εξυμνούσε την πρόοδο που έφερνε η επανάσταση των σιδηροδρόμων και δεν έβλεπε όπως η ρομαντική ότι αυτοί παραμορφώνουν το αγροτικό τοπίο και διαταράσσουν την ιδηλιακή ατμόσφαιρα της εξοχής. Ιδιαίτερο ενδιαφέρον έχουν οι επισημάνσεις για τη λατρεία της τεχνολογίας που μοιράζονται, παρόλε τι αγεφύρωτες διαφορές τους, ο μπολσεβικισμός και ο ναζισμός. Και εδώ ο Τραβέρσος στέκεται σταθερά απέναντι στη θεωρία των δύο άκρων. Γράφει. Παρά τι επιφανειακέ ομοιότητε και την κοινή αντίθεση προ τη φιλελεύθερη δημοκρατία, οι κοινωνικέ του βάσει, οι ιδεολογίε του και οι στόχοι του ήταν ριζικά αντίθετοι. Αν πάρουμε υπόψη τι οικονομικέ του δομέ, σοσιαλισμό απέναντι σε καπιταλισμό, αλλά και το διανοητικό του υπόβαθρο, διαφωτισμό απέναντι σε αντιδιαφωτισμό, το να μιλάμε για ολοκληρωτικό ιανό με δύο πρόσωπα, ένα κομμουνιστικό και ένα φασιστικό, δεν έχει κανένα νόημα. Ωστόσο, αυτό που μοιράζονταν σε σχέση με τη λατρεία της τεχνολογίας ήταν τα πιο τέλεια τεχνικά μέσα που χρησιμοποιήθηκαν και ως ένα βαθμό η θεοποίησή τους. Ο Τραβέρσο, στη συνέντευξη που του πήραμε με τον Τάσο Παπά για την εφημερίδα των συντακτών, όταν του θέσαμε την ερώτηση «Τι σήμαινε πρακτικά αυτή η ταύτιση» μας απάντησε. Πρώτα απ' όλα, θα έλεγα ότι αυτή η λατρεία της τεχνολογίας, αυτή η φετιχοποίηση της τεχνολογίας, δεν είναι σίγουρα μια ιδιαιτερότητα του φασισμού και του σοσιαλισμού. Νομίζω ότι αυτή η εξειδανίκευση της τεχνολογίας είναι χαρακτηριστικό του σύγχρονου πολιτισμού 
συμπεριλαμβανομένης της φιλελεύθερης δημοκρατίας. Οι Ναζί λάτρεψαν τις τεχνολογίες της εποχής, από το ραδιόφωνο και τον κινηματογράφο, μέχρι και τη βιομηχανική οργάνωση των στρατοπέδων συγκέντρωσης και θανάτου, κατ' εικόνα των σύγχρονων εργοστασίων, αλλά και την αξιοποίηση προϊόντων της πρωτοπόρας γερμανικής χημικής βιομηχανίας, όπως το Cyclone B, το γνωστό χημικό που χρησιμοποιήθηκε στους θαλάμους αερίων. Εξού και ο χαρακτηρισμός αυτού του ναζιστικού ρεύματος ως αντιδραστικός μοντερνισμός. Από την άλλη, το πολσεβίκικο καθεστώς, αποθεώνοντας την τεχνολογία και ανάγοντας την ανάπτυξη των παραγωγικών δυνάμεων σε απόλυτο κριτήριο για τα πάντα, ενδίδει σε ένα παραγωγισμό και μια αναπτυξιολαγνία, τα οποία αναγορεύει μάλιστα σε ιστορικό νόμο. Η λατρεία αυτή φτάνει στα όρια τη με το θέμα της ταρίχευσης της ορού του Λένιν, το οποίο έγινε αντικείμενο έντονης διαφωνίας ανάμεσα στο Στάλιν και του Στρότσκι και Μπουχάριν, αλλά και τη σύζυγο του Λένιν Κρούψκαγια. Τελικά, επιβλήθηκε βέβαια η άποψη του Στάλιν. Ο Τραβέρσο μας λέει ότι αυτή ήταν η έκφραση μιας πολιτικής θρησκείας και ότι η ταρίχευση σηματοδοτούσε μια συμβολική αθανασία. Αυτό μας φέρνει πάρα πολύ κοντά στο σημερινό κίνημα του διανθρωπισμού, δηλαδή του transhumanism, το οποίο πρεσβεύει ότι ο θάνατος είναι μια ατέλεια της ζωής και κάτι το παράλογο, το οποίο όμως μπορεί στο μέλλον να θεραπευτεί. Έτσι, χρησιμοποιεί τη μέθοδο της κρυογονικής ή της βελτίωσης του ανθρώπινου σώματος με τεχνητά και έξυπνα μέλη, ώστε να κατασκευαστεί ένα cyborg. Είναι πολύ υπερπλούσιοι, όπως για παράδειγμα οι ιδρυτές της Google, Larry Page και Sergey Brin, οι οποίοι οραματίζονται κάποιο είδου συμμορταλισμό, δηλαδή αθανασία. Πρόσφατα επίση είδαν το φω τη δημοσιότητα έρευνε που προβλέπουν ότι με τι κατάλληλε παρεμβάσει στο ανθρώπινο DNA θα μπορούμε να ζήσουμε μέχρι και 200 χρόνια. Όπω λέει ο Τραβέρσο, τη δεκαετία του 20, ο Αλεξέη Γκάστεφ, γνωστό ω ο Ρος Τέιλορ, φανταζόταν τον σοσιαλισμό σαν ένα κόσμο αυτορυθμιζόμενων μηχανών και έγραφε Η μελλοντική κοινωνία θα διευθύνεται από συμπλέγματα παραγωγής στα οποία η βούληση των μηχανών και η δύναμη της ανθρώπινης συνείδησης θα συγκλίνουν για να δημιουργήσουν ένα αδιάσπαστο κόσμο. Ενώ και ο Γερμανός Ernst Γιούγκερ προέβλεπε την πλήρη μηχανοποίηση της εργασίας και την κατάργηση κάθε φράγματος μεταξύ τέχνης και τεχνολογίας. Και τελικά βέβαια την ανάδυση ενός νέου ανθρώπινου τύπου με μεταλλικό σώμα όπως έλεγε. Φυσικά το βιβλίο αυτό δεν είναι μοναδικό μόνο για αυτές τις αναλύσεις. Ο υπότιτλό του, μετά τον τίτλο Επανάσταση, είναι η διανοητική και πολιτισμική ιστορία. Και ο συγγραφέα μένει απόλυτα πιστό στην υπόσχεσή του. Κάνει εξαντλητικέ περιγραφέ και αναλύσει για τα κυριότερα ρεύματα του 20ου αιώνα, προοδευτικά και αντιδραστικά, ήδη από το 19ο αιώνα. Για τον εθνικισμό, για τον αντισημιτισμό, για τον φεμινισμό, τα δικαιώματα των ομοφυλοφίλων, για τον σουρεαλισμό, για το κίνημα των Μποέμ και δεκάδε άλλα. Η επεξεργασία αυτή είναι κατά τη γνώμη μου πρωτοποριακή, καθώς αξιοποιεί ένα πολιτισμικό πλούτο ζωγραφικών πινάκων, ταινιών, συμβόλων, αγαλμάτων, σημεών, αλλά και κάθε πράγματος που θα μπορούσε να μας διευκολύνει να κατανοήσουμε σε τι συνίσταται η κάθε εποχή και ποια ήταν τα βασικά τοπόσημα των χιλιάδων περιστατικών με τα οποία καταπιάνεται. Ιδιαίτερο ρόλο στο βιβλίο διαδραματίζουν τα σώματα, τα οποία καταπιέζονται, βασανίζονται, επαναστατούν και απελευθερώνονται. Όχι όμως για πολύ, καθώς ένα νέο κύμα αντίδρασης έρχεται να σκιάσει το φως που έχει προσωρινά ρίξει ο ήλιος της Επανάστασης. Αυτή είναι η σύνθετη διαλεκτική που μας περιγράφει ο Τραβέρσου, ο οποίος απορρίπτει την ευθύγραμμη πορεία της ιστορίας προς μια υποτιθέμενη πρόοδο και μας θυμίζει ότι αυτή διακόπτεται από ρήξεις, ασυνέχειες και πισωγυρίσματα ορισμένα από τα οποία θέτουν σε κίνδυνο ακόμα και την ύπαρξη της ανθρωπότητας, όπως είναι σήμερα η κλιματική αλλαγή. Και για να ξαναγυρίσω από εκεί που ξεκίνησα, θέλω να πω δύο λόγια για αυτό το περίφημο ορίζοντα της προσμονής. Η αριστερά θα εξακολουθεί να ζει τη δική της μελαγχολία όσο απομακρύνεται από αυτό τον ορίζοντα, όσο δεν παρουσιάζει ένα πιστικό σχέδιο για το μέλλον και έναν οδικό χάρτη για να φτάσουμε εκεί. Διαφορετικά, οι μόνοι ευνοημένοι θα είναι οι ακροδεξιοί λαϊκιστέ και οι φασίστε δημαγωγοί, οι οποίοι δίνουν στο ευρύ κοινό αυτό ακριβώ που ζητά: απλοϊκέ απαντήσει που ικανοποιούν την ανάγκη του για πνευματική οκνηρία. Όσο πιο απλή είναι η εξήγηση, έστω και απατηλή, τόσο πιο έφορο το έδαφο που, που βρίσκει στου πολλού. Στη συνέντευξη και την εφημερίδα των συντακτών που προανέφερα και στην ερώτησή μα εάν η αριστερά πρέπει να επανεφεύρει τον εαυτό τη, ο Έντσο απαντά. 
Ναι, αυτό είναι ξεκάθαρο για μένα, ότι η αριστερά πρέπει να επανεφεύρει τον εαυτό τη. Γι' αυτό η ανησυχία μου και σκοπό του βιβλίου μου είναι, δεν είναι να υπερασπιστώ την κληρονομιά τη αριστερά. Νομίζω ότι ο 20ο αιώνα τελείωσε με μια ιστορική ήττα τη επανάσταση και αυτή η ήττα είναι επίση προϊόν πολλών λανθασμένων αντιλήψεων και περιορισμών τη αριστερά. Άρα, η αριστερά σίγουρα πρέπει να επανεφεύρει τον εαυτό τη, όχι μόνο επειδή οι παλιέ συνταγέ τη απέτυχαν, αλλά και επειδή αντιμετωπίζουμε στον 21ο αιώνα ένα σύνολο προβλημάτων, τα οποία σίγουρα δεν μπορούν να αντιμετωπιστούν με την κουλτούρα τη παλιά αριστερά, του κομμουνισμού, του σοσιαλισμού ή του αναρχισμού ή αρκετών αιρετικών ρευμάτων του, κοσμ... του κομμουνισμού. Αυτό περιλαμβάνει όλη την αριστερά του 20ου αιώνα. Άρα, δεν πρέπει να επαναφέρουμε την παλιά αριστερά, πρέπει να εφεύρουμε μια νέα αριστερά. Λοιπόν, ο λόγος τώρα στον Έντσο. So, thank you very much, uh, Tassos, for this introduction. You summarized very well uh, my book. Many thanks for this invitation. I'm delighted to be here, uh, to have this opportunity to discuss with you about uh, my book. Uh, also in this building, I learned uh, this building is uh, a realm of memory for the Greek left. Uh, uh, and uh, so I learned also that uh, this uh, meeting uh, takes place uh, simultaneously with uh, a demonstration on Palestine, and uh, in my spirit, I will also be with uh, the demonstrators. Uh, so many thanks uh, to Tassos for, and to um, Kostis for accepting uh, to discuss uh, with me uh, about my book. I uh, would like to thank uh, um, my publisher, so, Ecdosis to Eikos to Proto, uh, and uh, also my wonderful Greek translator. Mm, all over the years, we established uh, a special relationship of, uh, of complicity, <laughs> and not only of intellectual exchange, but also of complicity, I would say, and without uh, their efforts, uh, my books uh, wouldn't be known and read in, in, in Greece. So thank you very much for that. Unfortunately, I don't speak Greek. Uh, my English uh, is very poor <laughs> and pitiful <laughs> too, but uh, I hope it will be understandable. I, uh, I will say a few words on my book in order to open a discussion that I suppose uh, in, in these uh, very hot days uh, probably will transcend uh, my book and will touch uh, a lot of topics uh, uh, extremely relevant to today for our intellectual and political debates. But uh, a few words about uh, my book and why I wrote this book. There are many reasons which are uh, related uh, to an historiographical uh, debate. Uh, my book is an intervention, a critical intervention in this debate, uh, but uh, I wrote uh, this book also for other reasons, uh, transcending, going far beyond uh, the boundaries of uh, um, an historiographical debate. So this book is also uh, related to, uh, so broadly speaking, uh, to um, uh, zeitgeist. So a certain intellectual atmosphere, which uh, uh, is very widespread today on a global scale. It seems to me that uh, the world itself of revolution is blurred. Maybe 
this word always has been a little bit ambiguous because the semantic field of the word revolution is extremely large. Uh, you are used to speak of uh, industrial revolution, technological revolution, uh, cultural revolution, sexual revolution. So revolution means a lot of things and sometimes also uh, antipodal things. But in recent times, uh, this word became uh, extremely mm, uh, confused, blurred. Uh, I think that uh, this uh, concept uh, has lost uh, its uh, uh, interpretive, its heuristic uh, uh, strength. Uh, it was abused. Uh, think of uh, 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 the language of the media. Tassos knows <laughs> very well this problem. Uh, revolution means everything. Uh, the, 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 a new iPhone is a revolution. A new hairdressing is a revolution. Uh, a few years ago, Emmanuel Macron uh, the uh, president of the French Republic uh, uh, announced uh, uh, his participation in uh, the elections. Uh, and Emmanuel Macron is the embodiment of neoliberalism in, uh, in the European Union today. And he announced uh, his participation in the presidential elections, uh, publishing a book titled Revolution. So, if revolution uh, uh, is, if everything is revolution, revolution doesn't mean anything. So uh, uh, I think this is a problem. Um, uh, speaking of historiography, the, the word revolution, the concept of revolution experienced uh, in the latest decades, uh, uh, huge uh, metamorphosis, huge transformations. Uh, we could give many examples. So in the past, uh, revolution was a very strong uh, interpretive key uh, for uh, reading and uh, understanding modernity. Historians like Eric Hobsbawm, for instance, uh, wrote books in which uh, the history of modernity was uh, written by revolutions. Revolutions were cuts, were historical turns. And history could be interpreted as a sequence of revolutionary breaks. The French Revolution, the 18th, 48 revolution, the Paris Commune, the Russian Revolution, uh, the Chinese Revolution, uh, the uh, Cuban Revolution, and so on and so on. So revolution was for us uh, a kind of uh, uh, reference, uh, uh, a kind of, uh, of analytical tool allowing us to uh, understand it. so modernity. But when we read uh, the most ambitious uh, uh, histories of the 19th and the 20th century, published uh, in recent, uh, in the last uh, 10 years, uh, so revolutions uh, appears, appear as uh, almost uh, accidental events. So we shifted from, uh, from an idea of revolution which was grounded in an almost deterministic causality to a, a view, a completely different view of revolutions as accidents of history. And in these books, well, Jürgen Hosterhammel, for instance, or 
Christopher Bailey, revolutions uh, are epiphenomena. The Paris Commune, which was so relevant and which forged an historical experience that forged the imagination of several generations, so became an accidental event uh, during the French-Prussian uh, War in 1871. Uh, well, mm, when I was 20 years old, it was clear for me that after the First World War in Central Europe, uh, several revolutions uh, had taken place. The Spartakist Revolution in Germany, uh, Hungary, Austria, in the Baltic countries. So today, all these events uh, are rather interpreted uh, through uh, different categories. For instance, as uh, moments, uh, crucial moments in a process of nation building. Uh, for me, the Spanish Civil War had a powerful revolutionary dimension. But today, uh, the Spanish Civil War is uh, interpreted uh, through different uh, categories. Also, for instance, as genocide. 30 years ago, 40 years ago, nobody could have uh, uh, thought to the Spanish Civil War as genocide. But today, this, this, this was uh, uh, um, a, a relevant uh, historiographical approach. Uh, at the same time, uh, a new historiographical concept appeared, the concept of fascist revolution. Fascist revolution uh, is uh, um, uh, a formula that uh, belongs to the fascist uh, lexicon, to the fascist propaganda and ideology. Mussolini spoke of fascist revolution. Uh, the Nazis uh, depicted 1933 as the National Socialistische Revolution and so on. But uh, so in recent times, this fascist language was uh, incorporated into uh, a historiographical methodology and became a strong uh, uh, analytical category. So, in other words, uh, a, a word belonging to the fascist propaganda became a central concept of uh, the historiography of fascism. Uh, for, for good and bad reasons, but uh, so this uh, engenders uh, a new uh, narrative of the 20th century. The 20th century was the age of violence, the age of wars, genocides, and revolutions, in which we had fascist revolutions and uh, socialist revolutions with a kind of equivalence between them. So in other words, the 20th century was the age of totalitarianism, and we have to take a distance with respect to, to that. We live in uh, a beautiful age of <laughs> market society and liberal democracy. And well, uh, uh, I think that uh, so these uh, changes in the use of this concept of revolution as uh, so are extremely important. And my book uh, wished to clarify this uh, very confused uh, uh, intellectual and also historiographical landscape. But uh, as I said, I wrote uh, this book also for all the reasons, uh, for, I would say, for intellectual and political reasons, uh, because uh, so this word, this concept of revolution uh, in the past, in the 19th and also in the 20th century, 
was uh, uh, a very complex uh, concept. It was simultaneously uh, uh, interpretive and strategic. Uh, it was uh, prescriptive and uh, charged with uh, a strong political dimension. The concept of revolution was useful not only for interpreting history, but also for making history. Hmm? Well, something changed. Something changed because the social and political movements uh, that uh, uh, appeared in uh, the latest, uh, so 15 years, which were powerful social and political movements, uh, which uh, uh, were uh, subversive movements, movements uh, that put into question the established order, starting from Occupy Wall Street in the United States, uh, shifting to Europe, so Syntagma Square in Athens, uh, La Nuit Debout in, in Paris, and then uh, the Yellow Vests uh, till the most recent demonstrations and strikes in, in, in France uh, or Quince in Spain. So we could give a lot of examples. Or uh, true revolutions, like the Arab revolutions, hmm? or more recently, what happened in Iran. So revolutions or uh, social and political movements with strong, powerful, revolutionary potentialities, all these movements never claimed the revolutionary heritage of the 20th century. So, uh, I said that all these movements revealed enormous revolutionary potentialities but they didn't claim the revolutionary legacy of the 20th century. They expressed a very significant loss of historical memory, which, which was entangled with an enormous creativity in terms of invention of new forms of action new ideas, uh, uh, new critical approaches to reality, but at the same time, the incapacity uh, to inscribe themselves into a historical continuity, simply because the revolutionary paradigms inherited from the 20th century, which meant Bolshevism, communism in all its variants, and, and, anarchism uh, appeared as obsolete and almost useless. So in other words, uh, a, a break of historical continuity took place and uh, the concept itself of revolution has to be reinvented. Uh, this is one of the reasons uh, for which uh, I thought it was important to uh, 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 write this book. So I didn't uh, uh, write this book uh, with the spirit of uh, the uh, guardian of the revolutionary temple in order to uh, defend the tradition against uh, uh, the innovations or, or uh, the uh, changes, uh, but uh, it seems to me that uh, uh, this missing link uh, is uh, harmful, is, uh, is problematic. And uh, this uh, uh, break of historical continuity has an explanation. And uh, I think uh, uh, the cause 
the source, uh, uh, the origin of these, uh, 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 of these uh, lack of historical continuity depends on the historical defeat of the revolutions of the 20th century. Uh, the, so, interpreting or uh, uh, um, thinking uh, the history of the 20th century through the prism of, of the left and of uh, uh, left culture, we could say that the 20th century started during the First World War with uh, uh, Rosa Luxemburg, who launched, so forged, this uh, uh, powerful slogan, socialism or barbarism. And in my view, this uh, alternative uh, is <laughs> extremely <laughs> uh, uh, pertinent today. So this alternative is the alternative of the 21st century. But, uh, we cannot simply repeat this slogan. Or if we uh, 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 think this alternative is still valuable, is still pertinent, uh, we cannot uh, uh, simply repeat it. We, uh, we are compelled to reformulate, to uh, uh, recreate this slogan introducing in this uh, uh, alternative the historical consciousness of the simple fact that uh, the 20th century was a century of revolutions, was a century in which socialism won in several countries uh, because of revolutionary breaks. Uh, because of revolutionary upheavals, uh, won against capitalism, and finally socialism itself became a dimension, a face of barbarism. And uh, this tragic epilogue, conclusion of the 20th century, is burdening the new movements, is not only a burden for our memory, but uh, is something that uh, uh, is, is, a, is an incredible, incredibly uh, heavy burden also for these new movements, even if they are not completely conscious of that, because they are uh, uh, um, uh, the young movement uh, gathering young people, <laughs> 20 years old, uh, who didn't uh, experience the revolutions of, of the past. But nonetheless, this historical defeat is a burden for all social and political movements of the beginning of, of the beginning of the 21st century. So, uh, this is also one of the reasons for which uh, my book uh, 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 begins uh, with uh, this uh, image, this uh, uh, painting of uh, uh, Theodore Géricault, a famous uh, romantic, uh, romantic uh, uh, painting of uh, the early 19th century, uh, uh, a canvas depicting a shipwreck. And I think that uh, looking today so at uh, this uh, painting of the past, it appears as a kind of uh, allegorical representation of uh, the defeats of, uh, of the revolutions uh, of the 20th century. But uh, if you look at uh, this uh, uh, um, canvas uh, uh, carefully, you can observe, and maybe you can <laughs> go to, you can observe a detail. So the image of a black sailor 
a black sailor uh, waving a, uh, a small piece of cloth, a red uh, uh, cloth, like, uh, like a red flag. So, and this image is at the same time a representation of a shipwreck, of a defeat, but also uh, is an image of hope. So redemption is possible. A rescue is possible. It's not a certainty. It's not uh, something. Socialism certainly will, will not be uh, uh, an ineluctable outcome of history. Socialism is not the result of a process uh, which could be depicted according to a kind of historical law. But socialism is a possibility, is something inscribed into the uh, uh, emancipatory potentialities of human beings. So in other words, socialism can be understood as a wager, as a bet, as a possibility, a chance to grasp and a chance that uh, coexist with the possibility of barbarism, of a catastrophe. And the, feature, the features of barbarism are so very clear <laughs> for, for uh, all of us. Well, uh, I don't know if, uh, well, uh, very shortly, the concept of revolution uh, changed in history. Uh, the word revolution is a very old word, but the modern concept of revolution appeared with the French Revolution. The French Revolution changed the meaning of this word. Before the French Revolution, revolution was an astronomical concept or uh, according to its etymology, so meant a kind of, uh, of return, coming back to the origins. History was conceived of as a cyclical process. And uh, so the English revolution of the 17th century wasn't uh, lived as a revolution. It was lived as a civil war. Uh, in the 17th century, uh, in England, uh, so people used to speak of the glorious revolution in order to define the restoration of uh, a constitutional monarchy in 1688. The American Revolution became the American Revolution retrospectively after 1789, because the American Revolution was experienced as a a war of independence, and also as a revolution in the sense of the restoration of the rights of uh, the uh, colons in, 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 in America. So is uh, the French Revolution that uh, uh, invented this new meaning of the word. After 1789, revolution means uh, a break in historical continuity means uh, uh, a violent uh, 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 social and political change, the overthrow of, of, of the established power, the instaurate, so uh, 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 the uh, creation of a new power. And uh, uh, revolution is a movement from below, is a dramatic social and political change related to the uh, uh, collective mobilization of uh, the ruled, of the oppressed, of the dominated, of the subaltern classes. So in my book, I, uh, I try to, the, to, to, to grasp the, the core of this concept of revolution. What is 
a revolution, so roughly speaking, a revolution is an exceptional uh, 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 moment in history in which for uh, 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 several unexpected circumstances, suddenly the oppressed uh, become historical subject. Uh, uh, take, uh, become aware, take a consciousness of their extraordinary strength, of their capacity to change the world. People who for centuries were uh, submitted uh, and also uh, in many cases uh, humiliated and uh, despised suddenly uh, 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 become political subjects. And uh, so in these exceptional moments, uh, all appears, uh, all seems possible. Revolutions are factories of utopias. Revolutions are moments in which uh, suddenly society is projected into the future. We can invent a new future, an alternative society, a completely different way of, of living, of establishing social uh, relationships. So revolutions uh, are moments in which the future is invented. Uh, and uh, uh, revolutions uh, uh, are... Uh, uh, so, uh, factories of utopias uh, with uh, all its beautiful and also sometimes its uh, hideous features. Revolutions, uh, in many cases, uh, result in civil wars in, we, in which these uh, expectations, hopes, uh, and uh, uh, utopias uh, coexist with uh, uh, um, implacable will of breaking with the past and of destroying the past. So they, they, they bring an enormous charge of, of violence and I think that we should be aware of that. Also looking at what is happening in, in, uh, in, in these days. So uh, mm, uh, the German historian Reinhard Kozelek uh, offered a very, I think, a very interesting definition of the concept of revolution. He wrote, uh, uh, revolution is an unconscious secularization of eschatological expectations. So this means that uh, Revolutions secularize uh, uh, expectations and hopes that uh, usually for centuries uh, had been uh, taken a religious form. So uh, 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 the realm of God has not to be expected for, uh, has to be conquered on the earth, so uh, is a, a profane action. So is something that we can conquer through a collective action. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that uh, this definition of revolution, so uh, 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 unconscious secularization of eschatological expectations, uh, basically uh, correspond with, uh, uh, corresponds with uh, Marx's definition of the Paris Commune as uh, an attempt at the storming heavens, storming heavens, conquering the heavens. Um, uh, uh, so uh, uh, the Civitas Dei has to be established and built on the earth, is a civitas terrena, uh, we, we could say. Uh, and revolutions, uh, 
uh, work like, like that. So uh, in my book, I try to uh, analyze a very large, a very huge uh, uh, intellectual, uh, aesthetic, uh, cultural, political, uh, theoretical landscape uh, 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 um, fixing two poles, fixing two uh, useful references. I think that uh, the history of modern revolutions uh, um, uh, swings or, um, between these two poles, two poles uh, that uh, could be uh, defined uh, with uh, uh, two uh, quotations. The first one belonging to Marx, who uh, after the 1848 revolutions uh, defined revolutions uh, as the locomotives of history, and Tassos already mentioned this passage of Marx, uh, on the one hand, and on the other hand, uh, Walter Benjamin, who in 1940, so almost one century later, uh, said, no, revolutions uh, are not the locomotives of history. Lo revolutions are rather the emergency brake with which human beings can stop this uh, historical process, historical uh, race, towards barbarism and uh, the catastrophe. It's very significant to, and interesting to observe that both definitions belong to the Marxist tradition, to different uh, interpretations of Marxism. Well, I think that uh, this beautiful and uh, quite uh, literary or, or, or uh, also uh, Lyric, I'm not sure of that. Anyhow, uh, so this beautiful definition suggested by Marx, revolutions are the locomotives of history. This image, uh, I think, uh, um, deeply uh, penetrated, deeply shaped the um, political imagination of several generations, till my own generation. So revolutions were the locomotives of history. History goes forward <laughs> uh, uh, thanks to revolution. There is a huge iconography, Soviet iconography in the first years of, uh, in the early 20s, uh, the first years of the Russian revolution uh, from Chagall to Tatlin uh, and iconography, paintings, posters, uh, architectural uh, creations, which depict uh, this uh, enormous, gigantic uh, jump of uh, the Russian society towards the future. But uh, so this definition, revolutions are the locomotives of history, obviously implies a very teleological view of history. Because if revolutions are the locomotives of history, this means that we know the destination and we know the end of history. When we take a train, travelers uh, know very well where. So this means that uh, history is uh, a process uh, running uh, throughout, uh, so along uh, uh, established rails, established tracks. Mm. And this teleological vision of history was very powerful in the 19th century. And for Marx, uh, revolutions uh, were the means uh, through which uh, so history could, uh, could uh, uh, go forward. So uh, revolutions were the product of this conflict between productive forces and re property relations. And from this uh, clash and this conflict, uh, so, so this conflict was uh, overcome by revolutions, uh, creating a new superior social formations, and so on and so on. So uh, 
uh, uh, is uh, interesting to observe that uh, this image uh, played a very important role for different gener generations and in, in several historical experiences. Uh, in my book, I, I mention uh, Tina Modotti's uh, photos of the Mexican Revolution in which uh, so trains played an important role. But uh, I also uh, devote uh, uh, several pages to this mythical uh, uh, armor and the train in which Trotsky uh, ran, ran along the front lines during the Russian Civil War. And uh, I suggest uh, a comparison because in, in uh, 1806, uh, Hegel uh, wrote when he uh, saw Napoleon in Jena, he wrote, I, uh, uh, I saw the, the, the uh, uh, world spirit, Weltgeist, and uh, he was on, on a white horse, <laughs> uh, Napoleon in Jena. So uh, one century later, so during the Russian Civil War, uh, the Weltgeist no longer uh, traveled <laughs> on a white horse, uh, he traveled uh, on an armored train. Uh, and this armored train was uh, no longer meant uh, the development of productive forces, uh, technological progress, and so on. This armored train uh, epitomized or symbolized the uh, expansion, not of productive forces, but rather of the world revolution going from Russia to Central and Western Europe, and then from Russia to China and to the colonial world. So uh, this image of uh, revolutions as the locomotives of history was powerful and, uh, uh, and, 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 and very uh, important. So it was related also after the Russian Revolution to the uh, invention, the creation of a new revolutionary paradigm which didn't exist uh, codified this way in the 19th century, a new revolutionary paradigm. Revolution means uh, a military conquest of power. And uh, making revolution means creating a disciplined army of uh, revolutionary fighters in a hierarchic, <laughs> uh, hierarch uh, in a, a hierarchically structured uh, 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 movement uh, um, whose purpose, whose objective is the conquest of power. And this paradigm was extremely important uh, in uh, China, in Vietnam, in Cuba, in all 19th, the 20th century, century revolution. Well, the second poem, the second definition of revolution as the emer emergency break, um, stopping this run of the train towards, uh, uh, um, uh, race of the train towards the catas catastrophe was uh, uh, suggested by Walter Benjamin in 1940. So in, uh, just before uh, he committed suicide uh, at the border between France and Spain. And uh, so this idea of revolution is completely different. Revolution, uh, according to Benjamin, uh, meant uh, uh, an act of memory meant the redemption of the past, meant uh, uh, a collective action for changing the present, but uh, a collective action uh, rescuing and uh, 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 liberating the vanquished of the past. Uh, revolution is the moment in which the past and the future clash each other. Uh, 
in which uh, suddenly the past uh, makes uh, an eruption in the present and uh, so many expectations and hopes belonging to the past can be accomplished in the present. And revolution is not a way to uh, accelerating the march or the race of history, but revolution is rather a way to changing radically uh, a civilization, uh, a, a model of society. And I think that today, uh, this uh, uh, definition of revolution resonates with our worries, uh, with our um, uh, culture, and also uh, with uh, 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 with the problems facing the 21st century. Uh, I think that this definition resonates very well with uh, political ecology and with all, with all movements uh, that try to inscribe the political ecology in a project of social change. Because uh, so revolution doesn't mean uh, uh, accelerating society in it, these uh, current uh, tracks means changing direction, changing uh, uh, um, uh, um, uh, uh, paradigm of, of, of civilization. Uh, well, a, a last uh, um, uh, observation, if I have five minutes okay. or three minutes, <laughs> I don't know. Well, uh, the uh, uh, revolutions uh, uh, have many temporalities uh, and uh, uh, historicizing revolutions uh, uh, implies uh, um, articulating uh, these different uh, and sometimes contradictory temporalities. Uh, there is a first revolutionary temporality, which is uh, the event. As I said, revolution is, uh, is uh, a historical break, is the invention of the future, is, uh, the, the, uh, is, uh, is something that uh, uh, cannot be reduced or explained uh, through uh, uh, its premises. Of course, all revolutions uh, have uh, conditions and premises, but all revolutions possess, have their own dynamic which transcends their premises because revolutions are this invention of the future. But this is the moment. So revolution as an event, as a disruptive, ephemeral, uh, exciting event. Revolutions are event are moments in which uh, people have this strange feeling of winning the laws of, of gravity. They are free floating, no? Because, uh, because, uh, well, uh, all has become possible. But uh, revolutions, when they are not defeated, revolutions when they are able to create a new power and to change society have so have to be interpreted as historical processes and revolution as an historical process means analyzing interpreting this very complex dialectic between the emancipatory moment of liberation and the authoritarian moment of the establishment of a new power. And uh, the problem is how to inscribe, for instance, figures like Napoleon or Stalin in the history of revolutions. Do they belong to the history of the French Revolution and the Russian Revolution? 
When I was 20 years old, my answer was clear. They were counter-revolutionaries. <laughs> and so uh, I'm not so sure of that. There is no doubt that Napoleon and Stalin destroyed the emancipatory dimension of the French and the Ru Russian Revolution, that uh, they betrayed the emancipatory spirit of the French and the Russian Revolution, no doubt about that. But, uh, uh, well, the conquest of the French Revolution were extended in Europe uh, throughout the Napoleonic Wars. And uh, Stalin never tried to restore capitalism in Russia. Stalin uh, wished to create a new society, a new civilization. And so many scholars, many historians uh, uh, show that uh, with many evidences. So a very, an extremely authoritarian and also totalitarian society. But uh, I don't think that they could be simply reduced to uh, uh, the embodiment of counter-revolution. There is a dialectic between revolution and uh, uh, um, authoritarianism, which is related to the, hist so the history of revolution considering its, uh, its uh, 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 long way. Mm, so its uh, temporality as a process uh, which is extremely complicated, but which cannot be simply evacuated. Saying revolution is wonderful, and then there are uh, the bad counter-revolutionaries uh, who uh, destroyed our dreams because both Napoleon and Stalin would be completely ununderstandable without uh, the French and the Russian Revolution. And then there is a third temporality of revolution, which is the memory of revolution, which is revolution as uh, a realm of memory, revolutions uh, as uh, uh, mm, uh, uh, inscribed themselves, entered our uh, um, memorial frames, our collective imagination, our cultures. So revolution uh, as a realm of memory means uh, something that uh, a, a whole of uh, values, ideas, images, experiences, uh, also symbols and myths, which were transmitted from one generation to another uh, through certain social frameworks, classes, or through uh, political parties and apparatuses. So, um, and this memory, which was so important uh, all over the 20th century, was broken by neoliberalism. With the end of Fordism, with uh, the uh, um, disintegration of uh, the working class movement uh, as it was uh, structured at the time of, of uh, Fordist capitalism, with the advent of precariousness and of uh, uh, so new forms of work, labor, uh, um, uh, new uh, uh, social relations, and also new anthropological paradigms. Uh, grounded on so individualism, competition, which have become enormous obstacles to the transmission of this uh, uh, revolutionary memory. So, and I finish now. So, uh, this idea of revolution has become a kind of Marano memory, hidden memory. Um, a memory that uh, doesn't appear on the surface. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe we could say that uh, uh, 
well, in Greece, we could say, so uh, this uh, uh, significant change of revolution as a realm of memory was, uh, uh, was described and represented uh, in, in a, a magnificent way by uh, Theo Angelopoulos in his movie, the Ulysses Gaze. So you remember this uh, sequence uh, called uh, Lenin's, uh, traveling, <laughs> traveling Lenin. So the uh, broken statue of Lenin uh, uh, um, passing um, so um, throughout the Danube uh, um, as well. Uh, a, a kind of funeral, uh, and at the same time, a possible rebirth, because uh, Lenin is coming back to the place where, where Marxism was created and invented. So maybe revolutions are ghosts coming from the past, but perhaps they also, or they still, uh, they are still announcing the future. I think that uh, both uh, options uh, coexist. And I will stop here. <laughs> so thank you for your passion. <laughs> Ε, να δώσουμε τώρα το λόγο στο Κωστή Καρπόζηλο, ιστορικό και διευθυντή του Νάσκη. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Tassos. We've decided to have this discussion in English, and then we'll open up the discussion and we'll have it in Greek. Uh, so, first of all, I want to thank the publishing house and Giannis personally for this invitation, and Tassos for and Enzo for their for the discussion we already had. It's obvious that all of us here were huge fans of your work, and uh, there is a reason for this. And uh, I was thinking, uh, rereading the book on revolution, that is a lesson, an exercise in political imagination. And this is not just an exercise or a lesson for the, for the reader of the 21st century to get acquainted with the ecology with the landscape of revolutionary movements and the concept of revolution of the past. But I also think that it is a lesson, in, an exercise in uh, political imagination because this, it is targeted for an audience. We, as the children, the byproducts of the end of the Cold War, where the revolution as a concept is not part of our lives. You yourself, State, you state in the, your introduction that you never witnessed a revolution despite being active in revolutionary movements. And I think this is the most difficult part of reading this book, is recapturing the tension or the probabilities encompassed in the concept of revolutions. Because our political imagination is by definition limited by our own experiences. The, this outlook, this, um, this reference to the issue of political imagination, I think goes hand in hand with a necessary exercise in the concept of contradictions. Usually within the political movements of the left, there is too much discussion about the contradictions of capitalism that would eventually lead to the downfall of the capitalist system. I think that this is a valuable book because it allows us to reconsider or rethink the inherent contradiction of the revolutionary project over time and how the transformations of the concept of uh, revolution in a way illustrate contradictory tendencies within the revolutionary movement. So the first one I, that stands out, or the first one I encountered, is this idea of the revolution being as a moment of disorder, a radical breach in historical time. That in the French paradigm, is associated with popular manifestations and the moment of joy. Five minutes ago, you referred you know, to this 
uh, that the revolution is by definition a negation of the laws of gravity with the masses feel that are elevated and they are experiencing something. You have this beautiful passage by Trotsky when he is addressing the crowds and he feels the bodies of those surrounding him that he is just expressing their intentions, dreams, aspirations. At the same time, the revolutionary project has this authoritarian dimension that you already mentioned in the moment when it becomes a regime. But also in the 20th century, especially in the 20th century, it becomes an exercise in discipline, order, and it acquires a repressive dimension for those speaking in the name of the revolution. If I can you know, insert my own cultural references, there's a film produced in East Germany in the 1950s on Telman, uh, a biographical film. And you have this scene there where it's Telman with his comrades. They all wear leather jackets. They're all men. They wear leather jackets. Okay, this is, you know, German aesthetics. Uh, they walk, it's a demonstration. They walk in order. Suddenly a young comrade is trying to indicate that there's something going on, going on and they should act. There's a reassuring movement by the leader of the movement of the of demonstration Telman himself that it is too early that the spontaneous action can lead to the de defeat of the revolution and suddenly when conditions are right when we have been ac accustomed to the, the rhythm of the of this march they see the opposing forces and now it is time to act again in a disciplined manner, in this militarized understanding of how history works, and they overcome the, the barricades of the police, and there is violence, but, but their violence is limited. No one is really killed there, because the revolution is such a powerful force of the disciplined body that it can overcome obstacles without necessarily getting caught in this act of the violent overthrow, or of this joyful moment of destruction of the old regime. So how do we combine, how do we understand revolution as a moment of joy and revolution as a moment of repression or, or a moment of discipline? And our, how our own selves, as part of possibly of revolutionary movements, have experienced these both uh, dimensions. The second contradiction or the second painful, uh, since we're talking about discipline, the second uh, painful dimension has to do I think, with the question of the nation. Reading the book, one uh, is following a rich discussion in the 19th century. There is, I think, a diverse ecology of revolutionary movements there and revolutionary thinkers, intellectuals. And one th thing that stands out is this unifying thread of the negation of the nation, of this this understanding of the revolutionary project, not just internationalist in terms of abstract theory, but internationalist or transnational because the protagonists themselves are exiles, they have you know, political refugees. And then moving to the 20th century, this concept, and you have another book on this, on the civil, European Civil War, the European Civil War in the post 1930s, 1940s discussion is um, followed by this understanding of the revolution as the expression of the voice of the nation, not as a, a destructive force of the nation. Internationalism is still there, but I felt that it becomes a rhetoric, a necessary rhetor rhetorical supplement to the proclamations of the revolutionary parties but not an embodied experience, not a natural experience of those speaking in the name of the revolution. The third uh, contradiction that came to my mind, or the third, the, you know, contesting uh, dimension of the revolutionary, of the revolution as a concept and the revolutionaries involved in revol revolutionary endeavors, has to do with what you've been. I mean, it's pivotal in the book, the idea of the belief in, in history. And I was thinking here that there is room for discussion about the role of the intellectual 
within the revolutionary movement. And there is a certain phrase that uh, came to my mind uh, by Jorge Sebrun in uh, What a Beautiful Sunday. So while he's discussing his contradictory experience as a communist who was in Buchenwald and how the communist underground was partially responsible for the operation of the, of the concentration camp, and at some point, he refers to this passage that, uh, that a revolutionary, in order to be a revolutionary, you have to be somewhat, I'm not quoting here, of a fanatic. That this absolute belief in history is the only, is the only way to be a true revolutionary. And that the moment that one becomes a better Marxist, understanding the contradictions or the nuances of historical development, that is the moment where one disengages from the revolutionary pro project because skepticism steps in and the revolutionary zeal, this determination of the individual believing in the strategic goal of the revolution is somewhat challenged by this feeling that possibly there are other alternatives to history. And that's my final, uh, final point. Reading this book, it is impossible, and because the author does not is willing to in, encourage such a, such a discussion, it is impossible to disengage from contemporary politics. It is impossible to have, you know, this uh, theoretical abstraction where we are reading something about the past, but one can feel constantly the agony of the of the author uh, about contemporary events. What he, I think we, we should possibly consider is how the goal of the revolution, this unpredictable moment in the past, went hand in hand with a certain understanding that revolutions lead to certain outcomes that in most cases were labeled with certain ideological ism, you know, isms, so socialism. Um, uh, is one word that comes to mind. Today, on the one hand, we have a proliferation of critical approaches to the neoliberal project, to the, the far right, the metafascist example. We have a number of critical understandings of what is going on, but even radical intellectuals or intellectuals who position the themselves within the Marxist tradition are quite skeptical or distant from naming this vision of the alternative society. So we have been discussing about alternatives, but we are unable collectively to name these alternatives. That is, about, this is a result of the defeat of the revolutionary and the socialist slash communist project of the 20th century. But I find it fascinating that you know, it's been now 30 years, we haven't really found a new language to describe this alternative future. And this is the inability, this is the limitations of our political imagination. Earlier this moment, uh, morning though, uh, Enzo Traverso uh, uh, agreed to, dis to discuss with a group of uh, graduate students from the University of Athens. And it was, I think it was a very nice, very fruitful discussion. And at some point, he made a reference, you made a reference, to what is ar the art of politics, responding to a question by Yorgos, I think, about uh, hope, responsibility, and violence. And you described the art of politics of the 21st century as a synthesis between the politics of hope, a, a renewed belief in history, and the politics of responsibility. And I think that this is a very fruitful synthesis of how, we can, how history can be, you know, uh, rejecting Marx's notion that history does nothing. Historiography possibly is, can be helpful in bringing these two together. Hope, but also responsibility. And thank you.
Λοιπόν, ε... I, I can try to answer your questions and commentaries very shortly in order to open a discussion, if possible, with, with the audience. Uh, so uh, it's not uh, so easy to answer your questions because they are complex uh, questions. Uh, I simply would say that uh, authoritarian tendencies uh, uh, belong to the history of the left, are not only the product uh, of uh, so problems uh, uh, that appeared after conquering power, but uh, so uh, uh, the history of socialism uh, uh, since uh, the beginning of the 19th century is also a history of uh, conflicting currents. And uh, among these currents, uh, we can easily find very authoritarian currents. Utopian socialism in the 19th century included uh, uh, what Ernst Bloch, Ernst Bloch uh, called uh, the, the, the cold utopias. When you read uh, Etienne Cabet, for instance, so his uh, depiction of socialism is <laughs> So he's a total institution of, of uh, discipline and, and, and oppression. So uh, revolutions uh, were also inhabited by these authoritarian pulsions or impulsions. Mm -hmm. And I think that we have to be aware of that. Of course, this is, this, 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 I think that this observation uh, uh, has nothing to do with uh, a conservative uh, cliché saying that uh, so revolution is uh, uh, the ineluctable source of totalitarianism uh, because uh, so the Bolsheviks were were horrible totalitarians uh, and uh, they took the power and obviously they created that totally so it's a different. Uh, kind of, 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 of reflection. But uh, so these authoritarian tendencies merged with uh, the uh, authoritarian dynamic of the new regimes created from revolutions once exhausted the so uh, emancipatory uh, potential of, of these revolutions. With respect to, so I think that uh, the, the second uh, point, uh, I, I think that uh, uh, the capacity of uh, uh, communism in particular in the 20th century, much more than socialism in the 19th century, because in the 19th century, socialism was mostly European, and socialism was shaped by a lot of Eurocentric prejudices. This myth of colonialism as a civilizing mission of Europe all over the world so was carried out by, by socialism. But in the 20th century, communism despite uh, its authoritarian features, uh, but communism had this capacity to articulate uh, an idea of world revolution, internationalism, with uh, uh, several national movements that uh, struggled for national liberation. Uh, and so in my book, I tried to sketch uh, a kind of typology of uh, the revolutionary intellectuals, and I distinguish between, for instance, uh, uprooted cosmopolitan revolutionaries and telluric uh, uh, cosmopolitan revolutionaries. Ho Chi Minh was uh, 
somebody who before leading the uh, resistance in Vietnam had passed uh, through 20 years of exile in, in London, in Paris, in, in New York, in, in, in Russia. So he was a very cosmopolitan figure. He wrote uh, novels uh, 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 and um, he was uh, also literary ambitions. But uh, when he came back to, to Vietnam, he became a nationalist leader and was recognized as the leader of a national liberation movement. Other figures of cosmopolitan intellectuals hadn't these capacities for different reasons, not only related to their mentality or culture, but also for historical circumstances. They were uprooted. And uh, they defended a kind of uh, national nihilism. So their internationalism was conceived of as uh, a kind of uh, transcendence of any national identity, culture, and, uh, uh, and claims. And uh, they defended uh, uh, an, um, a cosmopolitan and universalist idea of socialism that finally became very abstract and uh, incapable to, to, to be rooted in, in national context. So we can make many, many examples, but uh, I think that uh, Roughly speaking, in the 20th century, communism had this capacity. So that when we analyze the trajectory of, uh, of uh, uh, many uh, uh, revolutionary intellectuals and, politi and, and political leaders, then so I remember that yesterday we, we spoke about Pablo, Pablo uh, Michel Raptis, so is uh, a fascinating figure of cosmopolitan uh, revolutionary uh, who participated in national liberation movements uh, and uh, resistance movements, but finally, so he always remained a marginal uh, uh, intellectual. Mm. It was a certain vocation, we could say. It was ineluctably related to so the circumstances of the Cold War, Second World War, and the Cold War, and so on. Uh, so uh, um, well, maybe I, I will stop here because we have to. Λοιπόν, να προχωρήσουμε ε, λίγο, να γίνουν πέντε-έξι ερωτήσεις, όποιος θέλει να ρωτήσει κάτι, ε, αλλά δεν θα τις ε, απαντάει ο Έντζο μία-μία. Θα κάνει ένα μάζεμο στο, στο τέλος, θα τα συνοψίσει και θα, θα απαντήσει συνολικά. Ήθελα να ρωτήσω, με προβληματίζει στους καιρούς που ζούμε, που προσπαθούμε να κατακτήσουμε άλλους πλανήτες ή ζώντας την επανάσταση του AI. Ε, πώς μπορούμε να μιλάμε, επειδή μιλήσαμε για συμβίτας, πώς μπορούμε να μιλάμε για τον πολίτη σαν ιστορικό αντικείμενο, υποκείμενο, ε, και η εξέλιξη που διαβλέπουμε είναι μια επανάσταση τελειολογικά απέναντι σε αυτό ε, ή θα μιλήσουμε για ένα ιστορικό ασυνεχές με την λογική του ότι για παράδειγμα προχθές έψαχνα με το, μέσω του chat GPT κάποια αποτελέσματα για, για την εποχή του ναριζισμού στην ε, Γερμανία του 1935 και ο αλγόριθμός του σε κάποια φάση με διέκοψε να βγάζει, να παραγεί αποτελέσματα, γιατί δεν είναι σωστό. Έχει έναν ηθικό κώδικα δικό του. Και σκεφτόμουν 
η ιστοριογραφική κατα... η καταγραφή του μέλλοντος για έναν άνθρωπο, που όπως είπαμε, θα ήδη ζει ένα μεσά μας που θα είναι 200... θα ζει πάνω από 200 χρόνια. Τι λογική θα έχει ως προς αυτό, πόσο μπορούμε να μιλάμε για επανάσταση και την καταγραφή των επαναστάσεων ως προς αυτά τα ζητήματα. Ευχαριστώ. Ε, καλησπέριζω και εγώ χαίρομαι όλος ιδιαίτερος ε, που βρίσκεται κοντά μα σε ένα αυτός σημαντικό συγγραφέα για τους σύγχρονους καιρού. Εντάχει. Μία ερώτηση σχετικά με το ζήτημα της μελαγχολίας και της σχέσης με την Επανάσταση. Από ό,τι έχω καταλάβει στα έργα σας, κύριε Τραβέρσο, συνδέεται άμεσα τη μελαγχολία με μία έννοια αρνητικότητας που βοηθάει με κάποιο τρόπο να διατηρηθεί η μνήμη και έτσι να διατηρηθεί και η επαναστατική δυνατότητα. Ταυτόχρονα, σωστά επισήμανε ο κύριο Καρποζήλος ότι παρατηρούμε ένα έλλειμμα εικονιστική φαντασία. Κανένα δεν μπορεί να φανταστεί τι θα είναι αυτή η καινούργια κοινωνία. Και σκέφτομαι ότι ο Φρόιτ καλά έλεγε στο ζήτημα με τη μελαγχολία ότι το βασικό χαρακτηριστικό τη μελαγχολία είναι η ανικανότητα φαντασία του αύριο. Το μελαγχολικό υποκείμενο είναι αξιδιάλυτα πιασμένο σε ένα λιμνάζον παρόν και αδυνατεί να φανταστεί τον εαυτό του στο αύριο. Και αναρωτιέμαι. Πώς αυτή η αρνητικότητα που περιγράφεται και μπορεί θεωρητικά να διατηρήσει ζωντανούς, ζωντανές στις ατραπούς της μνήμης, ταυτόχρονα έχει παγιδεύσει σε υποκείμενα στην ανικανότητα να στοχαστούν το σταλινισμό, να στοχαστούν την ιστορία του 20ου αιώνα και έτσι να περάσουμε σε αυτό που έλεγε κ. Καρποζήλα στην αρχή της ευθύνη. Δεδομένου ακριβώς ότι η αρχή της ευθύνη έχει ενοχή, άρα αναστοχασμό του παρελθόντος, Μπορεί να απελευθερώσει τη δυνατότητα της φαντασίας που η ίδια η μελαγχολία αδυνατεί να το κάνει. Αυτά. Ε, καλησπέρα. Ε, ευχαριστούμε και να πω και εγώ ότι εκτιμώ πάρα, πάρα πολύ το έργο σα και το θεωρώ από τα πιο σημαντικά ε, έργα των σύγχρονων ε, διανοούμενων. Εμένα η ερώτησή μου έτσι κάπω θέλει να εστιάσει σε όλη αυτή την προβληματική που γεννάει το βιβλίο για την αριστερά σήμερα, κάπω. Ε, βασική ιδέα του βιβλίου και γενικά μια προβληματική είναι ότι η, επανα... η ήττα τη επανάσταση αποτυπώνεται αφενό στην ήττα ή στην παρακμή των ενεργών μορφών που έπαιρνε, είτε ήταν αυτή. Αυτή η λαϊκή, ο λαϊκό ξεσηκωμό, οι μορφέ αυτοοργάνωση, το κόμμα μετά, πιο μετά, ω η ένοπλη μαχητική μορφή. Αλλά ήταν, είναι και συγχρόνω, όπω είπατε και σήμερα στην παρουσίαση, ότι είναι κάπω και η απώλεια τη έννοια επανάσταση ω εξηγητικό ή ερμηνευτικό εργαλείο. Ότι πλέον δεν, δεν διαβάζουμε την ιστορία μέσα από αυτή την έννοια και δεν έχει αυτό το intellectual appeal που, που είχε, που διαμόρφωνε και το φαντασιακό. Πάνω σε αυτή τη βάση, δηλαδή σε αυτήν την αναγνώριση, που είναι κάπω σαν αναγνώριση αρκετά με τον άλλο τρόπο έχει, έχει διατυπωθεί, ε, νοημοποιήθηκε και θεωρητικά και πολιτικά η στήριξη ε, σε κόμματα τύπου ΣΥΡΙΖΑ, ε, με τη λογική ότι αφού δεν υπάρχει καμιά επαναστατική, και μάλιστα έγινε και πολύ σαν κριτική, σε οποιαδήποτε κριτική σε αυτά, σε αυτά τα κόμματα, ότι κάθε κριτική είναι σαν να επικαλείται τη λογική τη επανάσταση που πια δεν υπάρχει και αυτή. Η χρηματολογία χρησιμοποιήθηκε ακόμα και δηλαδή, στι πρόσφατε εκλογέ, δηλαδή πολύ μετά και από τα μνημόνια και από όλα αυτά, υπήρχε η λογική ότι ε, αφού δεν υπάρχει πια η λογική τη επανάσταση, τι άλλο μα μένει παρά να στηρίξουμε το λιγότερο κακό που αντιπροσωπεύει. Αλλά το ενδιαφέρον είναι νομίζω ότι η, και εδώ και γνώμη, ότι η, η ήττα τη επανάσταση είναι κάπω άρρηκτα δεμένη και με την ήττα τη μεταρρύθμιση ω προβληματική. Δηλαδή σήμερα εμφανίζεται εξίσου τοπική επανάσταση, όσο και η μεταρρύθμιση. Δηλαδή, φαίνεται ότι αυτό το δίπολο που δόμησε και την αριστερά και τους ανταγωνισμούς της αριστεράς παρασύρθηκαν μαζί, ιτήθηκαν μαζί. Δεν είναι δηλαδή το ένα ιτήθηκε και το άλλο έμεινε. Άρα, η ερώτησή μου είναι, άμα είναι να επαναεννοήσουμε ή να reinvent, επαναεπινοήσουμε την, την αριστερά σήμερα, αυτό μήπως δεν σημαίνει κιόλας ότι θα πρέπει να εγκαταλείψουμε 
και αυτή τη λογική της διαχείρισης ή της λιγότερο κακής διαχείρισης ε, και να προσπαθήσουμε να αναγνωρίσουμε τις ριζικά διαφορετικές συνθήκες που ζούμε σε σχέση με το 19ο ή τον 20ο αιώνα, αλλά ότι θα πρέπει να εγκαταλείψουμε όλο, όλο ή τουλάχιστον να σταθούμε κριτικά σε όλη αυτή την παράδοση και όχι μόνο στην επαναστατική παράδοση. Όσο μπορούμε πιο σύντομα, για να μην έχουμε και τοποθετήσει. Okay, yeah. okay. right. Θα απαντήσω, Ιωνσο. Yeah. So, I, I will try to, to gather these questions, uh, answering them uh, in a few sentences. Uh, so, maybe the best way to connect these questions with uh, my presentation could be coming back to this definition of uh, revolutions as the locomotives of history. I think that uh, this definition was so powerful because uh, uh, it uh, uh, gave to uh, uh, the working class movement and uh, so the left wing movements are an extraordinary strength. They gave them what we know today retrospectively, what uh, we know it was an illusion, but uh, it gave them this uh, uh, consciousness that they were acting Uh, in the sense of history, that uh, history belonged to them. We know where history is going, and we are the conscious actors of this spontaneous movement of history. History belonged to us. The future belonged to us. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, uh, this means that uh, when uh, very ordinary people, uh, rank and file activists, communist militants, uh, were uh, captured and deported during the Second World War in a Nazi concentration camp, for instance, in, they immediately created uh, uh, an underground cell. They immediately started uh, a, a work of resistance. And they were conscious that uh, this resistance uh, implied, uh, with many chances, uh, the possibility of being executed. But uh, they Uh, thought that uh, uh, they were fighting for a cause that uh, transcended their individual life because uh, they belonged to a movement which uh, was building the future. Revolutions are locomotives of history were that. So this enormous strength disappeared. Also because when we speak of a historical defeat of the revolutions of the 20th century, we are speaking of a historical cycle which is exhausted. These revolutions or many of these revolutions were not uh, smashed, uh, crushed, so destroyed by uh, fascism or counter-revolutionary dictatorships or coup. So finally, we understood after the fall of the Berlin Wall and the collapse of the Soviet Union that uh, 
this idea of socialism, this idea of communism, this uh, uh, ideological and also organizational paradigms were obsolete. So that's the point. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that uh, uh, overcoming this kind of defeat uh, is not a simple. So maybe I'm, I'm saying that because I'm Italian. And uh, so, as you know, Italy was uh, a few decades ago uh, the um, country with uh, the most powerful communist party in the West. And uh, this so powerful communist party committed suicide. So wasn't uh, destroyed like uh, I don't know, the Unidad Popular in Chile by a fascist uh, coup. So it was self-dissolved. And this created an enormous vacuum. Hmm? So uh, we uh, experienced uh, in uh, latest years uh, a lot of uh, social and political movements uh, that uh, so clearly say we don't like this social model, this economic model. We don't like capitalism. We are looking for an alternative. This consciousness is very widespread, particularly among young generations. Uh, but uh, in the past, uh, this alternative uh, can, could be named. Revolution meant something. For, for, for millions of, 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 today we are unable to name this alternative because socialism was experienced and socialism failed. So we have to start from that. And uh, uh, the left-wing melancholia emerges from this consciousness. So in my view, uh, Left-wing melancholia is neither a disease, a sickness which should be cured, nor a therapy that should be prescripted in order to overcome this or this uh, dysfunction. So, Left-wing melancholia is a feeling belonging to the structure of feelings of the left. The left uh, was uh, an enormous, uh, uh, exciting uh, adventure for changing the world, which is uh, continuing in the 21st century. But uh, uh, um, the project of changing the world uh, uh, cannot be accomplished uh, only through projects, uh, doctrines, uh, or organizations. Uh, uh, requires mm, feelings, requires emotions, requires uh, a desire of uh, acting uh, uh, collectively, of uh, exchanging experiences and sharing feelings. And when these movements are defeated, this inevitably uh, uh, generated uh, a feeling, a melancholic feeling. And this melancholic feeling, this left-wing melancholia, has to be recognized as a legitimate feeling of the left-wing culture, not in order to idealize it, but uh, simply recognizing as a part of our culture. And uh, so, Mm, uh, uh, too frequently, uh, particularly the radical left, uh, stigmatized, stigmatized this feeling, uh, considering it as uh, a symptom of weakness. Because revolution was conceived of as, a, uh, through this military paradigm, if we are revolutionaries, we have to be strong, courageous uh, 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 fighters and uh, 
being melancholic means uh, revealing a kind of vulnerability, fragility. So I think that we have to overcome that. And maybe the new generations are no longer obsessed with this mythological figure of the guerrillero, of the uh, uh, revolutionary fighter who belongs to a disciplined, so uh, disciplinated, so uh, a kind of well organized and hierarchical, uh, also from a gender point of view, hierarchical structure and, and, and movement. So we have to overcome that. And then maybe we will be able to uh, 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 create new uh, names. Well, from this point of view, maybe the, the, the radical rights uh, have an advantage. Because in the past, fascism, uh, I said that this morning in our discussion, fascism uh, possessed an utopian dimension. Fascism uh, had this ambition of, uh, of depicting the future, the myth of uh, the uh, thousand year Reich, or, or so the myth of uh, so the new man and so on. Today, uh, post fascism is very conservative, but they have some answers. Answers which are very reactionary, xenophobic, racist, uh, uh, um, uh, conservative, but uh, we have to defend uh, the traditional values. We have to defend the family. We have to defend uh, national identity. We have to protect uh, the Christian Europe and Christian nation against uh, the Islam and Islamic invasion and so on and so on. They have answers. Uh, we are criticizing uh, uh, the uh, established economic and political order. We are all perfectly convinced, and we also produced a lot of, 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 of uh, uh, studies, of uh, analysis. Uh, uh, critical thought is extremely sophisticated and rich today much richer than it was one century ago. But we are unable to so name uh, the future, to uh, um, uh, to give a perspective. So this is the enormous obstacle uh, which the left is facing today. And what happened with uh, so Podemos in Spain and Syriza in Greece, Two, I, I, I mentioned two countries which uh, uh, aroused enormous expectations in Europe in the past years. Mm -hmm. So we had this idea that uh, a new, an alternative, a new idea of the left, a new project uh, uh, could come from Spain and Greece. So the, the road was... <laughs> <laughs> much more, much more difficult and, uh, and uh, uh, full of obstacles that we, we thought. So that's, that's the point. Uh, but, so I'm, I'm conscious, I'm aware that uh, this answer is not satisfactory, but, uh, but we, th there we are. <laughs> there. Uh, Λοιπόν, κάπου εδώ ολοκληρώνουμε. Σας ευχαριστούμε πάρα πολύ.